It's time to start yet another series. Daily Thunder, you know, we've had a lot of episodes. Uh, this is, I believe, 1,098, which means our next celebratory moment is 1,100, which should be on Friday of this week that we are currently uh, starting. Uh, this is a Sunday night, and for those of you that didn't catch anything from the last series I did, which was called Life and Leadership Lessons from Teddy Roosevelt, We've been doing something in this quote-unquote off-season, which is a misnomer because it's not really off for those of us that work at Ellerslie, but we don't have students here. And our students are arriving for an advanced training uh, April 1st, which is coming around uh, soon. But we've been trying something different, and it's been a unique uh, tactic, and that is to gather on Sunday nights once a month and do four episodes all at once. And I would say that I have really enjoyed it. It gives a certain momentum that I'm able to build up through four messages. And for the Teddy Roosevelt series, that was actually really fun because uh, each of the uh, subsections I was doing sort of gained their own momentum and had a theme uh, to it. Uh, this series is very unique. I've done series on periods of history, uh, World War I, World War II, the Black and White America, which was 1914 and 1974. And I had a series of the missionary movement to Papua New Guinea and Daring to Do is Stanley Dale. Uh, I did do a couple, you know, sort of biographical sketches with the one I just did on Teddy Roosevelt. I did one on Alfred the Great, which was extremely powerful. Uh, and this is sort of in that zone. It's more of a biographical sketch, but with the focus and with the purpose, not of actually getting you to just see a certain life, but to have us learn through that life how we are to live ours. So it's one of those spiritual lessons uh, from uh, sort of series. And it's called Legendary, which is not as clear as something like spiritual lessons uh, from World War I. And it's like, it doesn't have as much clarity to it, which I sort of like. And I really love the word legendary anyways. It's just one of those words that stirs me. It's like the word epic uh, in and of itself. It's just a, it moves my soul. It has such grandeur just sort of woven into it. So I'm going to give you the title slide, which will start to give a little more away of where this is going. And uh, to do that, I need to turn on my clicker. Isn't that a great way to start a series? So... Uh, it's called Legendary, and it's, the subtitle is When Remarkable Feats Are Performed by Seemingly Unremarkable People. And if you look at that picture, there might be some recognition, I don't know, uh, but there is a character in there that you should know, and that there's someone else in there that you may not know. And I really, I looked for pictures of my dad and me for quite some time, and I don't have a lot of options that aren't like family photos, you know, where the whole family is clustered together. And so this is the only one I found, and it was like, uh, it, there weren't a lot of options for it. And so whether you like the photo or not, this is, I like it for the reason that it makes my dad look huge, and I look small, which is actually what I want in this series. Because this, in a sense, is a, is a tribute to if not the most important man in my life, one of them. He's right up there, and it's sort of hard to say that he's not the most important man that has ever been a part of my life. So if I'm going to do a series on Teddy Roosevelt's, you know, isn't it fitting that I would actually honor the man that impacted me far more than even Teddy Roosevelt did? So part one is called Win One for the Gipper. It's somewhat of a play on words, since my dad's name is Winston, and or was Winston, and... Uh, he was known as Win, And so if you've never heard the phrase, win one for the Gipper, I'll at least give you a little uh, background on that. But this is uh, me attempting to win one for the Gipper. So the dedication of this series is for the Gipper, my dad, whom I affectionately still to this day refer to as Daddy. He was a legend to me. Now, for some of you, he's not a known character. You've if you've gone through Ellerslie, you've heard me mention my dad, and I've given various stories, but uh, he only came to Ellerslie once, I think, and was introduced to whoever was present. In other words, this world wasn't very acquainted with him. He passed away in December of 2021, and so many people in my life today may not 
have a full cognizance of who he was, what he, how he lived, and the significance of his life. And for all practical purposes, I would say my dad lived an unremarkable life compared to someone like Teddy Roosevelt, compared to someone like Alfred the Great. And it's very easy for us to measure the value of someone based on that remarkability factor. And that's part of what this series is about, is to show you that in the kingdom of heaven, it's not how well known you are or how dynamic your remarkable factor is. It's how you live when no one is watching. My dad lived his life without any of you seeing it. And so very, very few people on earth ever have someone like me stand up and represent a life that was unseen. And that's what this series is about. So George Gipp, you remember this is called Win One for the Gipper. George Gipp was a, uh, a standout uh, running back or halfback for Notre Dame. And he is going to have sort of a tragic ending and die. And Newt Rockney is going to visit him in the hospital before he passes away. And he's going, even the dates are really interesting because it's almost exactly 100 years before my dad is going to pass away. And so this concept of win one for the Gipper is George Gipp is going to have a famous statement to Newt Rockney, who then eight years later, when the Fighting Irish are really struggling in their season, Newt Rockney is going to pull on this memory of George Gipp, and he's going to bring it up in a famous speech to his players before the start of a key game, which they are going to then win. And it's a major upset. It's a huge turning point for Notre Dame football. And so even to this day, if you go into the Notre Dame locker room, you will see this quote from George Gipp on the wall. He said, sometime rock, when the team is up against it, when things are wrong and the brakes are beating the boys, tell them to go in there with all they've got and win just one for the Gipper. I don't know where I'll be then, Rock, but I'll know about it and I'll be happy. And so this is winning one for the Gipper. Uh, I know my dad is, you know, we don't oftentimes understand the significance and the relationship between the heavenly realms and earth. We understand that the Holy Spirit, his angels are very attuned to what's going on down here. But it's like, what about someone that passes away? How does that relate? Well, I can't answer those questions with concreteness. However, I think all of us sort of have an understanding that the significance of this battlefield down here is not lost on those that pass away. That if there is such a thing as a great cloud of witness, that it is very potentially in observation at some level of what is taking place down here. And I think if you've ever had someone near and dear to you pass away, it is a very interesting thing to walk through your life and recognize that the way you're living, they can now see. And you want to honor them in the way you choose to live. So there's my dad, Winston Reynolds Ludi, also known as Daddy. So I tried at various points in my life to change from the daddy to dad, you know, because all the cool kids in school called their dads dad. And daddy doesn't sound that cool, just to be honest. And I tried and I could not do it. He wasn't dad. Dad sounded like a different guy. And so I, I, it was daddy. And I would slur it every now and then when my buddies were around, but I still had to say it, you know, and I don't even think he would have answered if I said, hey, uh, dad. He would have been like, excuse me, uh, you think that's me? So he was daddy. And uh, a father the way a father should be. Now, if I was to try and prep you for this, the purpose of this, I could do this on my mom as well. Who knows? Maybe I will someday. Uh, my mom had a significant impact on my life. Why I'm choosing my dad, you know, that's, uh, you could ask that about any series I do. It's like, now, out of all the possibilities, why did you choose this one? And in a sense, I feel that there is something significant in this generation right now in history where it is important to model the opposite of where our culture is going, which is a diminishment of our elders. It's a diminishment of our history. It's a canceling of that which has value and importance. It's looking for blemish instead of looking for virtue. And when you do that, you fall apart as a culture. When we stop honoring those that have gone before us and instead we criticize and fault find it, we fall apart. 
We as a church cannot participate in this. We have been given the grace to go in a completely opposite direction, which is to pay tribute and honor and to see what God sees instead of the many foibles and flaws that are in existence in each of our lives. We could do a message on each of our lives in here, it'd be a very fascinating message, don't you think, where we talk about all the mistakes we all made. Or, you know, it could be all hand, I get a list of all the mistakes you've made and then I just rehearse them. And I talk about all the times you blew it. Wouldn't that be powerful? No, that would not be very powerful. That would not be very encouraging. And the great thing about the heavenly lens is the shed blood of Jesus changes the way God relates to us so that he no longer sees our failures and our fumbles, he is able to see us through a different lens. He, instead of seeing caterpillar, he sees butterfly. And for me as a son, I have to make a decision because my dad was an imperfect man. So do I rehearse to my soul where he fell short or do I rehearse to my soul where he succeeded and where he showed me the living God? My choice. And you're going to see my choice in this series. I don't know if any son or daughter has ever done a 12-part series on their parent. Of course, it is somewhat odd to have podcast series in the first place, right? And so it's a novel thing to do a podcast series, but it is an unusual thing. There have been books written and, and things like that, but this is an unusual format for paying tribute. Maybe one message, which I've done, but this is an unusual thing that I am doing, and I'm not actually just focused on my dad. I'm focused on what he represents in my life and how that is also in your life. And so we can just sort of work through this together. This is not for my own aggrandizement or my own feelings to close a book in my life and to finish a chapter. It is actually for us as the body to model something moving forward. My desire in this series to convince you that my dad was an amazing dad. It's an interesting tactic, don't you think? I, when you listen to any of these series, if you go through the, my series on Alfred the Great, you like Alfred. If you go through uh, Daring to Do with Stanley Dale, Stanley Dale was not that likable of a guy, and yet you like Stanley Dale. Because it has to do with the glasses that we are choosing to wear. We could pick anyone in this world and we could find reason to not like them. And even the most likable character, we could find a flaw and we could really play that up and you'd be like, oh, I'm disturbed by that character. Or we could choose the Christ lens. And when you do that, it's amazing, but you can find the deep friendships with people that you never met. It's like, I really like that character. When I was going through the Teddy Roosevelt series, you guys started to like Teddy Roosevelt, even if you didn't before I started. When we went through the Taft portion, some of you, Taft became your favorite president. You joined my, my son Hudson in considering him the greatest president out of uh, you know, all presidents. It's how you look at these characters. The modern propensity Let's be honest, be real and raw. Let's bring down our heroes to a level even the most mediocre human could replicate. This is very common. We are writing biographies after people die. We release news. We, we discover tidbits of information about people that we once thought were great, but then once they die, let's besmirch their name. This is a very common thing, and if all you have to do is think a little and you'll begin to realize that this is actually a very real movement. You know that doesn't make any of us that might pass away, might pass away, that will pass away someday? It doesn't make you feel very sturdy when you're walking through life realizing that everything you're doing and investing in could literally be stripped away and called evil when you die. Very interesting thing that we are facing as a generation, which is why I'm saying I'm going the opposite direction. My dad passes away, and I want to model something that we as the church need to cultivate in our behavior. My agenda, take a man who most would consider rather unremarkable and show you how remarkable, seemingly unremarkable people can actually be. You know how encouraging this has the potential to be, especially if you consider yourself rather unremarkable? You see, the remarkable behavior that heaven sees is not always what is written in books or made into movies. 
It's not what the news is oftentimes broadcasting. Most of great Christianity is lived under the radar, and that's why it's so great. If it was lived for the camera, it's not great Christianity. That's Pharisaism. But when you live out the most remarkable feats and no one ever sees it, no one ever applauds it, that's something special. And that's why I'm calling it legendary. So without further ado, one for the Gipper. The power of a simple thank you. Very few remember to come back and give it. You guys are all familiar with this story, but it's a good reminder for all of us. Luke 17, 12 through 14. Then as Jesus entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Whoa, supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ. So they have a need and Jesus meets it. And yet, in Jesus meeting their need, they are so amazed at this new freedom that they have in their life that they forget to return and actually give a simple thank you. Now, it's interesting how easy it is to take for granted this same thing in our life. I mean, Jesus, what does he do? He heals, he redeems, he restores, and he does it every time. I mean, come on. This gets old after a while, doesn't it? Yeah, he forgives. You you make a mistake and he forgives. Sure, yeah. You can almost consider it just sort of taken to the bank. There's no real shocker value here, is there? And so many of us like the nine lepers that didn't return, because there is one guy who does. We oftentimes take for granted the amazing gift of grace in Jesus Christ, but not just in Jesus Christ. One of the most common places to take for granted a gift of grace in our life is with our own parents. They pour out their life, they serve us, and what, 99 out of 100 things they do for us, we just think, well, that's just what a parent's supposed to do. And so we fail in returning, we set a pattern in our life so that when God begins to restore us, redeem us, and is consistently forgiving us and offering us mercy, we then can easily take that for granted. Luke 17, 15 through 19. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine Were there not any found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. So obviously this is in the Bible for a reason. And it's supposed to direct us. It's supposed to instruct us in a behavior because every single one of us has a serious condition far worse than leprosy. And if we are not healed, we don't just die a physical death. We die an eternal death. We need a savior. Master, save us. And so I'm not going to say that in this room, we have not shown gratitude and thankfulness. I'm just saying that we as the church should be specialists in the very thing that this entire series is about, which is we want to pay tribute and honor, not just at the highest level to the God who has healed us and restored us and redeemed us, forgiven us, shown mercy time and time again, been patient with us, given us blessing after blessing after blessing, but then all the micro pictures of that in our life, that those people that have yielded to the working of grace in their life and then through their life have offered us that same healing, that same love, that same compassion that Jesus has towards us. And that we do not want to just run off like the nine, but to return as the one. So I have pictures throughout this series that uh, you guys can enjoy, but there's, I, I had a tough time finding pictures, to be honest. My, my family obviously was not that great at this picture thing, but my mom is in the picture. There's my dad and there's me. I'm somewhere around 20, maybe 21. Uh, Leslie is actually in the picture over here. All, we have all sorts of family in that picture. So, uh, but Leslie and I, I don't, I think we may have been in a relationship, like in an understanding at this time. 
Uh, but that's at least to give you uh, somewhat of a context. Awakening to greatness. When you as an adult finally see what you couldn't see as a child. I don't know why this has to be this way. Why kids, why we as kids take a long time to wake up and to actually see what God has given us. Because when it's around you, and my, a great illustration is a Coloradoan, is when you see mountains every day, you don't think of them as, I mean, it doesn't mean you're not like, oh, they look beautiful today. It's just that you don't always appreciate it is when you go to the plains of Kansas for a while, and then you're like, dear Lord, why didn't I appreciate those mountains when I had them? And that is the case with so many things in our life to freshly allow the prick of God in our soul to remind us of what we have right now and not wait for your parent to die before you reminisce about the wonder and the blessing that they are to your existence. But to actually take and seize the very day that you're in right now to say, Lord, I wanna be like the one leper that returned right now. Not after some grand thing happens in my life, but even in the small things, I want to remember and to kindle within my soul and exercise that thankfulness. The story of Derek Redmond. Wait, that's my dad. I don't know if any of you remember the story of Derek Redmond. This is the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. And Derek Redmond is a British... Uh, 400 meter runner, and he's one of the best in the world. Uh, so I don't know if he still has the uh, record for Great Britain uh, as far as the 400 meters, but he's that good. In other words, he was a great runner. He's retired now. So this is way back in the day. I mean, we're going back quite a few uh, decades here. And I remember hearing the story. I didn't actually see it happen, but I remember hearing it, hearing about it, and someone just repeated it. And it so struck me because like I, I, I could call this the long slumber of childhood, where you have something so good in your life, but you don't actually recognize it until some moment you get struck and you get awakened. And you're like, you're, you mean not everyone has that? You mean I have something inordinate and strange and odd and amazing? That I was given something that other people weren't and you can freshly cherish it. And this is the story that sort of unlocked that inside of me in regards to my dad. And so it's odd to think of another dad and hearing about another dad and how he responded to his son actually is going to trigger in me an appreciation for my dad at a whole nother level. So this is in the uh, Olympics. I don't remember if this was a trial heat or if it was in the actual uh, you know, official uh, run for the medal. I'm, I don't remember those details, but Derek Redman is going to pull a hamstring like a hundred meters before the finish line. So he's trained his entire life for this, right? I think he's already won the world championships. He's one of the best in the world. And if, for whatever reason, as an athlete, you never are the complete athlete until you win the gold medal in the Olympics. And so he's trained, he's trained, he's trained, he's trained. And then he pulls a hamstring. He's on the, uh, on the uh, track, He's in agony. And I mean, this is a hard moment just for any athlete. And even as an audience, you just feel for these guys when they're in a situation like that. But then Derek Redmond sort of grits his teeth and he rises up and he's going to finish this race. And so he's hobbling along the track. I, sorry, the picture for this, this is you know, off of a video clip. It's not that great of a, a picture here. There are some great pictures, but he's hobbling along in agony. Then there's a disturbance in the crowd and a big man makes his way, sort of shoves aside a security guard, hops over the security fence and runs out onto the track. And that's Derek Redman's dad. So this young man is showing an incredible resolve to finish the race. But there is, as a parent, that this man is violating all protocol, by the way. You're not allowed on the track. I mean, this is a high security. This guy could be taken out. I mean, big time. This is a, a huge issue. And why they didn't take him out is actually somewhat of a mystery. It would have been a very really bad story if that had happened. But this man makes his way out onto the track. I, I was once told that his T-shirt said, have you hugged your son today? 
which I thought was so moving and I was so moved by it. But you can see in the picture, have you hugged your foot today? Not quite as meaningful, but uh, still, I really like my original rendition of how I heard this. I just love that picture. That's my dad. And a man that would stand with his son even when it was incorrect to do it. And he would risk whatever fine, whatever jail time would come with this, that he was going to be with his son in the moment his son needed him. I just love that. Uh, It's a portrait of this entire series right there. That dad, ironically, is legendary to many people that know this story. I mean, when he died, he's just a guy. The only thing he accomplished was that he was there on the track that day. Out of all of history, no one really knows this guy except for this moment. When he died, it was in all over the world. It's like dad of Derek Redmond, the guy that ran out of the track, passed away today. And so this this, this is the entire idea that I'm saying in this series is it's the remarkable moments. Most people don't see that in my life. They, didn't, they weren't there, you know, cheering on my dad as he did that for me. But that's why I think it's important for us to remember that most of the greatness that is exhibited in this world, the Christ moments are not seen, are not captured. The long slumber of childhood, when blessing is not recognized, sacrifice is not seen, and the greatest gift is overlooked. I don't know why it takes us a long time as kids to just wake up, but it's a long slumber. Unfortunately, there are some kids that never wake up, and they only see the wrong that their parents do. Parents are capable of a lot of wrong. They are. Okay, I, I'm not going to try and say that every parent uh, is just doing a great job out there. However, for us as children to learn to put the right glasses on and to look for redemptive quality even in the hardest situations is always important. Luke 17, 17 through 18. Were there not 10 cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? I want to return to my Lord and give proper thanks, for I am a life that was changed. In a sense, I want us to sort of see in the big picture, I recognize that I was given a gift in my dad. I see it. Even if you didn't see it, it makes no difference to me. I see it. I am a life that was changed because God gave me my dad. And in each of our lives, we are lives that were changed. If you're in this room, your life has been impacted at some level to bring you to a place where you're able to actually hear truth in a world full of lies. There is a gift of grace that has been bestowed to you, but do you see it? Do you recognize the uniqueness of your circumstance? Are you able to cherish it? Instead of treat it as if, well, yeah, obviously. Yeah, but that's not that big of a deal. It is a huge deal. My grave error. I remember when I was in my radical days, I had just come to Christ and I was back from college and I was living on, you know, I went on the mission field, I come back. I could not see the profound virtue in my dad. He was just a businessman. You know, yeah, he had integrity. Yeah, he was different than other dads. And yeah, he was always at my games. And yeah, he was always trying to encourage me. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I wanted, I wanted to be the son of C.T. Studd. I wanted Hudson Taylor as my dad. I mean, I just got this average guy as my dad. I was praying for a father of the faith. Lord, bring that Leonard Ravenhill, that, uh, that Hudson Taylor, that Andrew Murray to me, that they could take me under their wing. And I still remember, I'm calling this my grave error. The quote, I wish I could redact, which means to take back. This is what I said to my dad. I've been praying and praying for a father of the faith, but God hasn't answered my prayer yet. I've still never seen a truly godly man up close. And my dad got got really quiet. 
And then I realized what I just said. Now, I didn't fully see at that time, I still hadn't had my awakening, I was still in my long childhood slumber of only seeing a certain type of man as being the father of the faith. And yet, the reason I am a strong man is because of my father. And sometimes it can be so close that we can't see it. That's what I'm saying. The exercise of honor. The soul unlocks when it chooses to recognize blessings, see sacrifice, and cherish the gifts it is so graciously received. Your soul will unlock. There's so many ways that our souls can be inhibited. And oftentimes it's in a direct relationship to our ability to say thank you, to return to our Lord and say, I see what you've given me. I see the treasure store that you have imparted to me. And I want to say thank you to them, to to our Lord, and then to whatever the circumstance is to acknowledge the blessing there. Seeing perfection. Now at first, this is going to sound a little odd. And I want you to work with me here. Seeing perfection. It takes a special lens to notice it. If I were to say that my dad was perfect, I could just hear some of you go, yeah, great. And especially if you're a dad, you're like, oh, that's all we need is to hear about a dad that's perfect. Boy, because, you know, we're, as a parent, we're specialists in where we're falling short. Very rarely are we self-congratulating, <laughs> patting ourselves on the back saying, I've got this down. Parenting exhibits to our, to our soul our vulnerabilities and our weakness and how dependent upon our Heavenly Father we are to pull this thing out without ruining our kids, let alone helping them along. It's like we feel very vulnerable to harming them. And so for me to say this, I'm saying it takes a special lens to notice perfection. So follow me on this. Job 1.1, there was a man in the land of Uts whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. I don't know if you guys struggle with that. It's, it's a translation potentially, right? But when it says he was perfect, uh, I don't think anyone is actually perfect but God. That's, that's our good theological answer. And yet that's scripture right there. Now, again, translation is part of the understanding of the word perfect really helps. So look at this same, same verse, but with a different translation. He was blameless. You know that that's an interesting distinction between the two. You know that I can stand blameless before the throne of grace, but that doesn't mean I, there isn't a lot of reasons I could have some blame on me. You see, the amazing work of grace is that God is able to see us as blameless even though we have fumbled the ball many times. It's sort of like those kings that made mistakes, but it, you know, God says that they did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Usually there'll be a little caveat, except for the fact that they never got rid of this uh, altar. However, it's an amazing thing to think that our life could conclude with, we did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, even though, wow, there was a lot of things we did that weren't right in the eyes of the Lord along the way. Praise God that he doesn't you know, create some big list and hold that over us as we enter into the kingdom of heaven because we are entering in based on Christ's virtue, not on our own. So I'm gonna just say it, my dad was perfect. Now, I'm gonna explain something to you and it actually might really help you because as a son, and I've seen this in many kids, they can only see where their parents fell short. I have made a tactical decision in my life and I've been doing it for decades now to see where my parents were hitting home runs and to remember that. Now, I'm gonna explain this. So look at the the screen, it says, my dad was perfect. Listen to what I mean by that. He perfectly responded to his imperfections. You see, perfect in our eyes means never to make a mistake. However, in the human experience, we make far more mistakes than we do anything else. And so is there any hope for us? Well, of course there is. You see, the moment you recognize that you're wrong is the moment you have the opportunity to do this perfect. Because that's where we prove humility and dependence 
and trust in our God. His way is higher. Lord, thank you. You see, when we respond to our imperfections right, I'm going to call that perfect. Because we're going to make mistakes. The question is, how do we respond to them? Do we justify them? Do we rationalize them? Do we cover them up? Or do we respond to them with the grace of God? And say, that was wrong on me. My tone was wrong. That wasn't even true. I need to apologize for that. Yeah, the way I handled this situation, eh, wrong. Will you forgive me? So here's some pictures of perfection that I witnessed growing up. Eric, my attitude was not right. That wasn't how Jesus would do it. Would you forgive me? Eric, I know I haven't been there for you when you needed me. I'm so sorry for that. I may not have started well in this whole fatherly thing, but I want to finish well. Eric, I handled that situation poorly. I don't want you to think that that is how a man should act in such a situation. Please forgive me for setting an improper model for you as a young man. That's an extraordinary father right there. Now, when you're up close to it, you don't always see how profound that is. Sometimes you have to take a few steps back and wake up from your long childhood slumber to actually see how rare this is. The right now principle. What I have today, I can't, what I have is today. You see, right now, we can't change the past. I don't know if you've ever had that where the enemy's holding the past over you. He's dangling it over you saying, look at you, you stink. You can't change a previous behavior, a behavior that you've already done. It's past tense. But what you have is right now. And what you can do is perfectly respond right now. I've had to repeat that to myself, to Leslie and I as we're walking through ministry. It's like, okay, we're seeing 2020 right now. Like, I can see clearly that that wasn't the best decision. But I, I don't want to moan over that. I want to just say, what are we supposed to do today then? We're measured based on today's decision. How am I responding when I know what to do? When I know that that was wrong behavior, now I'm being measured right now but I can perfectly respond to my imperfect behavior and I can humble myself and I can turn to Jesus and I can say, please leverage this. So what I have is today, I can't change the past, but I can perfectly respond to the past right now in this moment. Now I'm enunciating one of the great secrets of successful Christianity right here. You see, the enemy wants to get us to grovel. He wants to get us to live in a state of disappointment with ourselves and with our circumstances, where we, we feel unworthy to participate in this grand thing known as Christianity because, well, look what we did here, and look what we did here, and look what we did here. However, a good God doesn't bring that up. He's ready to cleanse it. He's ready to move it off the table so that we have a fresh beginning right now. How to see virtue? Well, you have to choose to. See, I, I, there's certain things I'm not going to be able to talk about in this series. But I'm going to try and get as close to the edge of it as I can to help all of us who can easily get caught in the ditches that are just a part of this journey known as childhood unto adulthood, and then reproducing the same problems we grew up with if you had a challenge in your past. We have a tendency to say, I'll never be like that, and then the first thing we do when we have kids is repeat. Because we've seen something, it almost is like a default condition. And so one of the best ways to deal with that is to begin to see the virtue, not just the failure, not just the weak points, but the virtue and to cherish it. You know, I remember someone coming up to me and saying, Eric, you look just like your mom. And she meant well, but you have to recognize that didn't translate well to me. I don't want to look like a woman, right? And to her, that was, you know, my mom's beautiful, right? And so she's just saying something very nice to me. But a lot of us come up to a, a very solid decision in our life that I don't want to be like my parents. And we draw this line in the sand. And what I want you to not miss 
is that each of us has been given something in our life, and I want you to make sure you don't cut it off in the wrong way. I'm not saying I want you to replicate the fumbles and the failings of your parents, but I am saying that there is virtue, but sometimes you have to choose to see it, and it's risky, guys. I understand. It's risky because you feel like you're making yourself vulnerable to overlooking things that, hey, you know, we, we need to take stock of that. That wasn't good at all. Sure, it might not have been. And yet, when we oftentimes overlook the many gifts and many blessings and sacrifices that have been done on our behalf, we then can fumble the ball. What is needed to turn the tide? The turn of our hearts toward home. Malachi 4, 5 through 6. It's amazing because this is how the Old Testament ends. Right before Christ, in a sense, is going to come in and fulfill all of this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So I'm going to unpack what a father can do. And then I'm going to show you what a child can do. Now, I'm not saying this is exclusive just to fathers, okay? It's to any one of us that has been in the position of influence, in the position of responsibility, and we have blown it, or we haven't done it well. Remember, what I'm esteeming in my father isn't that he never made a mistake. It's that he responded to his mistakes with excellence. He humbled himself. That's one of the things that makes him legendary in my life. So here's a father step. Return to those to whom you have imperfectly showcased the glory of fatherhood and humbly acknowledge your shortfall. Seek forgiveness and offer to do whatever it takes to make it right moving forward. Share the right now principle. Remember the right now principle? It's like this. What I have is today. I can't change the past, but I can perfectly respond to the past right now in this moment. And that's where you say, hey, look, I, 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 unfortunately, I can't fix this, but I can fix it in the sense that I'm ready to do it differently right now. And that, that's doing it right, guys. So let's look at the child tribute. Now, some of you are gonna fall into this category. Some of you are gonna be a mix of both, where you've been the father character in this storyline, and you haven't been excellent in how you have parented or led. And there is a need for you to own that, but there's also, on the other, the flip side of this, the child side, that has been harmed or hurt and has many grievances maybe that have built up over time and have reasons why something needs to be corrected. Return to those that gave the best they could and say thank you. Ponder and take the time to remember sacrifices made, love expressed, blessing imparted, and mercy offered. Show honor where honor is due. So at the end of each of these messages, I have a picture of my dad. So I'm calling them pictures that just say it, sort of like I have a gallery that I'm going to be building here of uh, Win Ludi. And so this first picture is called Win It. And uh, the fi this is the final picture I ever took of him. We were on a sand dunes in Michigan uh, looking out at Lake Michigan. And I was sitting at the top of the hill because it was somewhat of a risk to walk all the way down to the bottom of the sand dune because then it's like, how are we going to get back up? So my dad and I were staying at the top and all the kids were running down there at the bottom. And this is him. This is a famous thing that he would do. He'd go, yeah. uh, and so this is the final picture. And so this is called Win It. Lord, thank you for the many blessings in each of our lives. Thank you for my dad. Lord, I pray that this series would be as an honor and a tribute to you. And may it turn many hearts of children back to their fathers and many fathers' hearts to their children. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.